All right. So yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Sizdek. I'm the product manager at Stolting. I'm here with Dr. Gail Royd, author of The Lighter 3, uh, Stanford Binet 5, Merrill Palmer, numerous other tests and articles. And we're just happy to have a conversation with Dr. Royd about uh, some of the testing work that he's done, uh, some information about some of the tests and benefits of nonverbal testing and working with The Lighter 3. So uh, welcome, Dr. Royd. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Well, Brian, uh, I have a personal story. The reason I got interested in nonverbal tests is that I have a son that's now an adult, of course, but uh, when he was young, he was misdiagnosed as almost uh, mentally uh, deficient. Uh, but it, I uh, jumped in as a father and somebody that knew about tests to suggest a nonverbal test, the original lighter at oh. that time. This is way back. Okay. Yes. And, you know, he it brought his score up enough that they made the right decision. He has a learning disability and some other factors. He had uh, speech uh, problems. He had stuttering and that kind of thing. So, you know, a, a verbal test was not good for him. Right. So, so I have had an interest in the lighter. Yes. And uh, so it's been wonderful working on it. And now we, we have the lighter R and now we have the lighter 3, the third edition. Yeah, yeah. So, so you've had a personal investment in nonverbal testing. It sounds like it's yeah. made a big difference for your son and your family. And, yes, um, very much so. How, how would that make a difference um, for other people who are experiencing similar issues? What are some of the benefits of nonverbal testing? Yeah, we have some, even some today, we're here at a conference, the School Psychologist National Conference, and already we've heard people say that uh, on other tests, the child might get uh, a score of 60 IQ or something, and then they use the lighter, and uh, they find that it's really, they have some abilities that have been masked by the verbal requirements of the other tests. So they'll get a, you know, a score like 80 or even 90. Uh, so children with uh, uh, autism, for example, are uh, restricted in their social interaction, and that includes speaking back and forth. So these are tests that do not require any speech at all on the part of the child or the examiner. We have a very uh, clear directions of pantomime kind of movements and gestures that you use, and everything is pretty much pictures, or uh, you can see here this little uh, set up here. This, this is placed on a, a table, and then, yeah, Brian, if you could show how you just... Sure, and there'll be several blocks that are set out in front, and the examinee has to match which block goes in the appropriate place. Yeah. Um, and so this is a lot more engaging for examinees. Uh, it is. You know, kind of more like a game format, and, and even right. good for people with fine motor difficulties. Yes, yeah. yeah. And the, I think there's a lot of children and a lot, a lot of even uh, adolescents that like to get their hands on something and move something rather than just respond or pointing only. Now, if there's a motor uh, disability, uh, then uh, it's possible to uh, have them just point to what goes where and they don't, they don't have to actually move the object. Right. So there's ways to adapt the test also. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing I like. There's a lot of flexibility in the directions of the lighter, and that was included yeah. in the standardization uh, right. to accommodate people of varying abilities and uh -huh. to be able to get a score for those people who otherwise might not be able to. For example, my co-author Lucy Miller has a friend that uh, this she has a, a son who is paraplegic. He 
he's, he's in a wheelchair, and uh, he basically responds with uh, eye movements. And so you have to have someone that has some expertise in dealing with that uh, condition and uh, have them assist in uh, interpreting what the child is doing. Right. But it's a lot easier with pictures than it is with some intense verbal tests. Right. Okay, right. yeah. Yeah, so, so we're really, uh, with, with tests like the lighter three and nonverbal tests, we're able to get a better picture of the underlying abilities uh, that might be masked by either a language issue or we know how much language is tied in with social-emotional status, um, SES, uh, and, and it's just going to reflect more of a lack of educational opportunities than under any underlying abilities. That's true. So there are children that maybe are recent immigrants to this country that weren't, didn't come from a uh, strong educational background. They may not have really been able to even attend school. So the more you can use pictures and movements of objects and toys and that kind of thing, the, the better to get a real assessment. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, and the, the lighter three, there's, of course, no, no test is completely culturally unbiased, but the lighter three uh, has a relatively low cultural loading. Yeah. And um, it's, it's backed up by, I know uh, you all went to great pains in including a lot of different groups in the yeah. lighter three standardization. Uh, and it's very representative. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of statistics that you use to, to see whether or not there's a bias. Uh, and we've collected enough of certain groups that you can compare them to a majority group and see if there's any difference in the way that items have been responded to. And then you can, we actually, during the uh, initial development of the test, remove pictures or uh, items that don't, are not promising or they have some misreading in certain groups. So, yeah. And the other main feature is there's a cognitive section which leads to a nonverbal IQ. And there's not that many tests out there that will give you an actual IQ, you know, for a nonverbal test. And uh, then the other side of the test is, is uh, in the realm of attention, memory, and more into the neuropsychological section, which comes in handy. Children with, you know, let's say learning disabilities or something, sometimes will look good in terms of the cognitive profile, but there are certain difficulties they have with attention and we don't want to mix the two. This is a change. It used to be that some of those tests were included in the IQ measure. Right. And we would see cases where just having a really poor uh, immediate IQ could drop your IQ uh, or uh, ability would reduce the IQ. Well, we want to keep that pure, so separating two sections. But there's also very few nonverbal neuropsychological tests, as you know, Brian, because you've worked on some of them. Right. And uh, for example, the Stroop effect is a very important thing that looks at your ability to uh, screen out information and not be distracted by uh, colors, let's say, in this case, uh, that are just, you're looking for red, and they throw in other colors there to try to distract you, but you have to look for the, let's say, the red dot or whatever. Right. So, so the, yeah. the lighter three does a really good job of teasing out all these different abilities and not having them overlap, and that way you get a clearer picture of where the strengths and weaknesses are in those different abilities and domains. Right. And it's kind of a fundamental thing. Uh, if you're going to develop a test, you want to have more, th you, you don't want to have just one test that results in an IQ. What you want is to look at fluid reasoning, uh, visual ability, uh, and then of course 
memory and some other functions. And so you have to have enough subparts of the test so that you can get a profile of strengths and weaknesses. And that's very important in this day and age in the schools. They're looking for uh, the strengths and weaknesses of children that are in special education, for example, uh, because you just using a global IQ alone is, is not enough. Doesn't you need to know what's happening kind of on the inside of that child. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's an efficient test to give. We have people who come up and uh, say, you know, it, it, you can administer it pretty quickly, pretty efficiently, yeah. and fo focus it on the areas you want to assess. So you get a great deal of information from yeah. a yeah. pretty quick administration. And that, that's good for people uh, who are short on time, like all the testing people and for, for test takers who might lose interest as the test goes on too long. Yeah, yeah and you don't want to wear the child out where they become fatigued at the end right. and their performance goes down. But we only require four subtests to get the nonverbal IQ. Well, there's a lot of other tests that will take, you know, maybe eight or ten subtests before you get an IQ. So yeah. Yeah. it's very efficient that way and the reliability is extremely high. Yes. Yeah, yeah great psychometrics and yeah. And speaking of numbers, um, I think one of the more underappreciated parts of the lighter three is uh, that it yields growth scores, which can be really helpful uh, to understand an individual's very, very fine detailed strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. and then be able to assess that change over time. Right. Can you say a little bit about what the growth scores are and uh, how they're measured on the lighter three? Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, honestly, there's some complex statistics behind it. But in terms of the practical use of it, what it does is uh, it kind of, instead of uh, assessing the child always to their age group, which is the standard way we, we have uh, norms and you're, you're compared to the average performance of children throughout the country, uh, these, this scaling allows you to... Uh, to anchor the score more in the skills that are in that particular subtest or uh, the IQ bundle itself. And so it's a matter of what skills does the child have. And as those skills develop over time, it stays on the same scaling number system and allows you to uh, track across time. And instead of having to give the test when they, let's say, at five years old, uh, they're compared to five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Now, when they're eight years old, three years later, which is the uh, typical length for uh, retesting in special education, uh, you're comparing them to eight-year-olds. What would what is better in this system is you're comparing them to. What they're, what they're able to solve, what, what, what the skill is that underlies it, and as that skill develops, they will be compared to other people, not by age, but by skill level. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Right. It's a little so, more complicated than that. To well, think no, of the that, that helps. Uh, I, I yeah. can see that would be a great benefit to be able to measure that change. You want to be able to, to test, yeah. implement your interventions, and then reassess and see that progress that's made. Right. Yeah. That's why we call it a growth scale. As, as the child grows in ability and skill, then you can track it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Lighter 3 is, a, I think, a really useful test. Um, we've, we've got some information on it uh, available through the website, and um, uh -huh. I'm happy to give additional information and uh, be able to talk with anyone who's interested and show how some nonverbal testing can work. And, and we appreciate you coming in and giving some information about uh, the benefits of the Lighter 3 and nonverbal testing. And, and anything else that would be helpful to know at this point? Any, any? Well, I'd just say that if you have any questions, Call Brian. <laughs> and uh, we have a you have a website, you have a catalog that you do, and you can get information that way. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think there's other ways to get it, more information if you want to. Right. 
also uh, the lighter three is we've written a number of chapters in various books. There's, you can find books that are, there's one called the Handbook of Nonverbal Assessment. And so if you want to compare it to other tests, you can look at a, a book like that and it'll compare various ones. One of the things that the lighter does is it goes from age three all the way up into 85 plus. So it's probably the only IQ related uh, nonverbal test that has that range. So otherwise you're buying two or three tests to cover that age range. And this way you can track the child with the same test for a long time. Uh, that's uh, pretty incredible that the test measures uh, that wide of an age range and, and yeah. that diverse of abilities. And you do a lot of bang for your buck that way and uh, test that measures cognitive, attention, memory for that wide of an age range. Uh, has a lot of utility. Yeah. Uh, so actually in the uh, elderly range, you know, there's a, a kind of a uh, worldwide change emergence of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia. So the uh, memory sections there being nonverbal allows you to work with someone that maybe as uh, an elderly adult has lost some speech ability or uh, you know, is, is even has immigrated to this country and for some reason needs some testing. Yeah. Uh, this kind of nonverbal test is better than a standard uh, test that requires them to speak in English throughout the test. Yeah. yeah. The other thing, uh, we've been getting a lot more traction with using the lighter three in research settings. Um, clinical yes. researchers uh, want a test that they can administer for their whole clinical trial. Um, they might have multi-site uh, study going on and they want to use the same instrument uh, with people in different countries speaking different languages. And so the lighter three has a lot of great application there. Yeah, very much. Remember, and this isn't always taught in the places where assessment is taught, and I've, I've taught many universities that do this, but uh, we, we always say, and uh, Richard Woodcock is another person that advocates this, is you can take these tests apart because every subtest is actually standardized by itself when you really look hard at it. And a lot of people think that you have to do everything on the test, and you do not. You can pick out part of it and use it in a research study or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 so you can be really, really efficient that way. One of the tests that applies to that maybe is some people are looking for attention and distractibility. Distractibility is hard to measure and one of the ways is what's called the Stroop effect. And uh, up until the lighter free, there wasn't really a nonverbal uh, option for the Stroop. Fortunately, we have an expert, uh, Christopher uh, Koch, who's been studying the Stroop effect for 30 plus years. So he helped us to develop it and make it possible nonverbal. Right, right. Yeah. So that's that's a great choice um, for anyone yeah. who would typically use the Stroop test, uh, which is a widely used test, yeah. good brief uh, executive functions test, but the person yeah. has a language issue. And right. if you consider all anyone who might benefit from a nonverbal test, uh, people with yeah. autism, people speaking English as a second language, uh, people with hearing communication issues, exactly. um, nonverbal testing just opens up a whole new world to testing for those people. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. Good. Well, well, look us up online or whatever, and yeah. uh, I think we'll help you a lot. And whatever, whoever you're assessing, I think you'll find it's yeah. very helpful. Yeah, essential to have a good nonverbal test, and I think the lighter three is a good one. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.